Hello folks, today we are going to talk about energy transformations. Again, our goal here is thinking about thermochemistry. Thermochemistry is all about heat. So we're going to talk about how energy transforms, how it moves from one place to another. Again, we are going to, at this in this podcast, we're going to talk about changes from chemical reactions. Again, we're studying heat chemistry, and we're studying about chemical reactions. Now, if we look at what energy is, the definition of energy is the capacity to do work, a car engine, or to supply heat, a wood fire. Those are examples of energy. right? But unlike mass, you can't measure energy directly. I can't go and put it on a scale. So you can only observe energy by what it will do. So you can measure energy indirectly. So, for example, if I want to look at some Cheetos, which my wife happens to love to eat, and you say, well, how much energy do they have in them? We can measure that in calories, if you think about it. And one of the ways to do that is you take a Cheeto and you burn it. And when you burn it, you put it under a can, let's say, of water. And what you do is you measure how much the water heats up. And we can do a lab where you do this. We've also got some demos where you do this, where you can just heat up some water in a can, and then you can measure how much the can, the water, heated up. And that gives you a good estimate of how much energy a Cheeto has stored in it chemically. Now we have many different types of energy. We have radiant energy like from the sun. We have kinetic energy like a car moving. We have potential stored energy. For example, at Smith Mountain Lake we have this big huge dam down here and the water that's up here, which is 200 feet higher than the water that's coming out the bottom, um, has a lot of potential or stored energy because it can do work as it comes in and turns the turbines which are down here. Um, we have electrical energy which is stored energy but we also have chemical energy and chemical energy is what we're going to talk about and for example that might be the chemical energy that's stored in a Snickers bar. All right um, now chemical energy is stored in chemical bonds and please write this down that it takes energy to break bonds and energy is released when bonds form. A lot of students get this backwards. Uh, it takes energy to break a bond. Okay, that's very important. And energy is released when bonds form. So pause the video, write that down. All right, so let's say that I have a reaction of methane gas, which is what you might have in your house to heat your house or to cook your food. And methane gas reacts with oxygen to produce water and carbon dioxide. So over here I've got some methane gas, and over here I've got some two oxygen molecules, and over here I've got a couple of water molecules, one up there and one over here, and then I've got CO2 down here. So what has to happen to make this reaction happen? Well, you'll notice that this oxygen right here is holding on to a hydrogen and holding on to a hydrogen. This is water. Well, where did they come from? Well, the oxygen's over here, and this oxygen is presently holding on to this other oxygen. So for this to happen, these bonds have to break. Think of it like breaking a pencil. That takes work. That takes energy to break a pencil. Right? These bonds also here have to be broken. All right? And when they're broken, two hydrogens can go and attach themselves to this oxygen. Now, when that happens, the formation of these new bonds releases energy. And actually, it releases more energy than it takes to break them. So as a result, this gives us heat. And that's why you can use methane gas to heat your house or cook your food. Similarly, we have the other two hydrogens, which are going to go over, and they're going to come over to this water. And the carbon that's left, which is in the middle, is going to come down over here. And these two oxygens are going to break apart. And this one is going to go on one side of the oxygen, and the other one is going to go on the other side of the carbon. Excuse me, not of the oxygen. The two oxygens are on either side of the carbon. And that makes... CO2. So some bonds are easier to break, some bonds are harder to break. So if we look at this, of course, the bonds up here are very childish and they will eventually break. These bonds have been together for a long, long time. Uh, they're going to be very hard to break and hopefully over here, these guys, those bonds are going to be hard to break. So if we think of the ones that we're looking at, the ones over here on the left are easy to break, which form these, which are going to be harder to break. Okay. So all combustion gener reactions generate heat. We've talked about that. So as we go from left to right, as we take our methane gas molecule and our oxygen and break it apart and form our water and carbon dioxide, we are going to be generating heat. And these are called exothermic reactions. 
So again, please write this down. Breaking bonds requires energy. Forming bonds releases energy. By the way, if you work, watch the Bergman and Sam's podcast, they say it backwards. So it's very, very important you get this right. All right, how do we know that we're right? Well, we know we're right because, for example, a match, an unburnt match over here, does not spontaneously combust and become a burnt match. To make this happen, we have to put energy into this reaction to make it happen. Think about it. What do you do with the match to make it start burning? Of course, you strike it on the side of the matchbox or the matchbook that you're working with. So to make this match start burning, you have to put in energy. You have to add friction, which adds heat, which causes the match to start burning. Now, once the match burns, it will continue to burn all right, until finally it burns out. So this match over here has some chemical energy stored in it, which is given off as heat, which then over here, that energy has been released to the surrounding environment, to the air. Right? So you put your hand close to it, your hand's going to get warm. Right? So the concept here is twofold. One is we have to put energy into this reaction. And two, when we get over to the other side, these things over here don't have as much energy as the things that were over here. All right, so we call this an exothermic reaction. You need to write that down. And you probably want to draw this graph as well. You'll notice we have something down here called delta H, the change in heat energy or the change in enthalpy. That's another word, enthalpy, H-A-L-P-Y. That's a word you need to know. That's the change in enthalpy of the reaction where we have a certain, again, let's think of it as a match. Here we have a match, and we strike the match, so we have to give it some energy to get it started. But then once it starts, it forms carbon dioxide and water, which are our products down here, and we have less energy down here than we had to begin with the reactants. But we've given off a certain amount of energy, and this is delta H. That's the amount of heat energy that we've given off by burning this match or this piece of wood or by burning methane gas or whatever you want to talk about. So that's all an exothermic reaction. And essentially what you're looking at over here is you go left to right is time. All right. Energy always flows from hot to cold, not the other way around. It always flows from the higher kinetic energy thing to the lower kinetic energy thing. So write that down. Always goes from hot to cold. And you say, wait a minute, do I really believe that? Let's say that I have a refrigerator. When I open that refrigerator door, I sure feel the cold air coming at me. Well, no, you don't, guys. What's really happening is the heat from your body and the heat from the room is actually going into the refrigerator to warm up the refrigerator. You always go from hot to cold, so the heat is going into the refrigerator. Right. You say, well, how come the refrigerator is cold then? Well, down underneath the refrigerator, way down here, if you take that little panel off the bottom, right, what you're going to see is some coils, and hopefully your coils are cleaner than these coils are. Uh, this is not my refrigerator, by the way. Um, and um, these things transfer heat out of, they, t they essentially remove heat from inside the refrigerator and put it into the room. Right, so that's what's actually going on. So if you put, you touch these things down underneath your refrigerator, you're going to find out they're pretty warm. And what they're doing is they're taking heat out of the refrigerator, putting it into the room. So they are removing heat from the refrigerator. So as a result, when you open the door, more heat wants to go in the refrigerator, and that's exactly what happens. All right, so why do you feel warm when you sit in the sun? Well, think about the energy flow. The energy flow is coming from the sun, and it's coming to you. So here's the sun up here, right? And it's pouring down heat on you, right? And you're getting warm because the environment is warm, and you are absorbing the heat from the sun. So why do you feel cold when you put your hand into a cold freezer? Well, it's because your hand is giving up heat to the freezer. Your hand is actually warming up the freezer. Again, energy goes from the hot thing to the cold thing. So when we study a system, we need to think of the entire system. We can't just think of the refrigerator. We need to think, for example, of the room. We need to think of the heat of your hand. All of those are pieces. So let's say you jump into a hot bathtub. All right? What happens? Pause the video and tell me what happens to the water and tell me what happens to you. Cool. Of course, you get warmer, right? Because you jumped into a hot bathtub. So the bathtub is very hot, so it warms your body up. But what happens to the water when it touches your body? 
Well, the water gives up some of its energy to your body. So as a result, the water is cooling down. So again, we're going from hot to cold, right? Your body is absorbing the heat from the water. So the water in the bathtub is getting cooler. Right? So you have to think of the entire system, not just your body, but you also have to think of the bathtub itself. So what we study is we study chemical reactions or physical changes. And we need to make sure that we study the entire system. So what, the way we look at it is we study the reaction itself and its effect on the surroundings. So when we study it, we're, we're going to talk about this in a future podcast in detail, but we study the reaction itself and the effect it has on the surroundings. Remember the Cheeto? We're not just studying the Cheeto, but we're studying the effect it has on the can of water that's above it. All right. Now, it is very in, it, uh, important that you know the law of conservation of energy, so write this down. Energy can neither be created nor can it be destroyed in any chemical reaction or any physical process. So write that down. Pause the video. Do it. All right. If the energy of an object decreases by some amount, the energy of the surroundings must increase by that same amount. Again, that's like you jumping in the bathtub. Your body's absorbing heat, so the temperature of the bathtub goes down. Now, notice we're not talking just temperature. In other words, the temperature of the bathtub doesn't go down by 5 degrees and your body go up by 5 degrees. That's not happening. Happening. We're talking about the total heat of the system. So your body might only go up by 3 degrees when the, the temperature of the water goes down by 5, or vice versa, depending upon how much water's there and how big you are. All right. Let's move on to the next thing. We'll come back to that in a minute. Exothermic reactions. That is, a, that is a reaction where energy is released to the surroundings. Energy is going outward, exiting. It has excess energy. I don't care how you remember it, but it's exothermic. In other words, an exothermic reaction is like a fire or like a match. It's heating up its surroundings. Energy is released to the surroundings, and that's how you know it's exothermic. These are the ones that we think of all the time. Most of the reactions you see around you are exothermic. But there are also endothermic reactions. So, for example, you can buy a cold pack. If you go to CVS or Walgreens or something, you can go and buy a cold pack. And uh, if you take it and there are actually two packets inside here, there's a packet and there's another packet inside of it. So if you break the one that's inside and then you shake the stuff around, it mixes the chemicals that are in there. And the chemicals that are in there are absorbing energy. So all of a sudden, this packet gets extremely cold. So when it gets cold, it's taking the energy away from your knee or whatever it was that you hurt. All right. So the energy is going into the packet. It's coming out of your body and going into the packet. And so that is called an endothermic reaction because it is absorbing energy. So write that down. All right, now again, we talked about heat versus temperature. Um, temperature is the temperature of Smith Mountain Lake is much cooler than the temperature of a cup of coffee. But let's say which one has more heat in it? All right, well, the answer clearly is Smith Mountain Lake because there's a lot more water there. So let's say that these were both at, oh, I don't know, let's say 85 degrees. All right, and you jumped into a cup of coffee versus you jumped into Smith Mountain Lake. All right, well, you're taking some of the heat out of Smith Mountain Lake, but you're not taking much of the heat out of Smith Mountain Lake. You'll change the heat of the coffee, but you're not going to change the temperature of Smith Mountain Lake. You're going to change the temperature of the coffee. Okay? So bottom line is heat is looking at the entire system, which is all the water, whereas temperature is just looking at the, you understand temperature, what the temperature of the water is or the temperature of the coffee. So even though the temperature of this coffee is hotter than the temperature of the lake, the lake, the lake has more heat in it, more heat capacity, and is holding more heat. All right, so the temperature of a system is the average kinetic energy of all of the molecules present. That's the temperature, whereas the heat of a system is the total energy of the entire system. Right? So that's why the lake has more energy than uh, the cup of coffee. So when we think of temperature, temperature, if we want to do that graphically, temperature is the average temperature, the average kinetic energy of the molecules, which is whatever this is, right? But the heat is all of this energy that's all stored in here for all of the molecules underneath the curve. So you can think of heat as all of that energy that's stored there versus the temperature, which is just a single number. Right? Uh, let, me, let me make one more comment. Let's say that I add more molecules. 
let's say that I have a bigger lake. All right. Well, then I'm going to have at the same temperature. Right. The lake's going to have the same temperature, but it's going to hold more heat. All right. So that's the way you should think of temperature and heat. All right. Let's go back to an exothermic reaction. The energy of the products are less than the energy of the reactants. We've talked about that. So what we do is we take the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants, and we come up with um, how much energy is in the reaction. Now, in this particular reaction, we're taking methane and oxygen and we're mixing them, and they produce carbon dioxide and water, and they produce a bunch of heat. All right. So if we take the products minus the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants, these products have a certain amount of energy. These reactants have a certain amount of energy, but the reactants had more. In fact, they had 902 kilojoules of energy, more. So when we take the products minus the reactants, we get a negative number, the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. So these, these things have a certain amount of energy. These have a certain amount of energy, but when we subtract them, when we take the energy of the products, which are these, minus the energy of the reactants, right, we have a difference of 902 kilojoules. Now, guys, the easiest way to remember this for me is if you have an exothermic reaction, your delta H will always be negative. So if you have an exothermic reaction, your delta H is always negative. Write that down. Exothermic reaction, delta H is always negative. Your energy is always being produced, so it's always on the right-hand side of the equation. So it looks kind of like this. So we have, um, we, we're starting with, let's say, our match again. Or you can start with methane gas. I'm okay. Will methane gas, if it's in the air, just start burning? No, it will not. It needs a certain amount of energy to start. So we give it a certain amount of energy to start, and once it starts burning, it gives us back a lot of energy. And when it gives back that energy, that's where we see something burning. Right? The actual energy that it gave us is only from where it started to where it ended because we had to put in this energy. It gave us back that energy we put in, but we did have to put in a certain amount of energy to make this thing happen. This is an exothermic reaction. All of your curves are going to start here with the reactants holding more energy than your products do because your products have less after an exothermic reaction. An endothermic reaction is exactly the reverse. An endothermic reaction is absorbing energy. So here your delta H is going to be a positive number. You are putting energy in on the left-hand side of the equation. So we take some ammonia, we put in some energy, and we get out hydrogen and nitrogen gas. So our graph there looks exactly the opposite. Here we have to put in energy. Our reactants have less energy, and they're going and producing products that have more energy. Think of that cold pack, it's absorbing energy and then it's storing them in chemical bonds which are up here. So that's what happens with cold pack. Right? It is absorbing energy. Now let's talk about a catalyst. We're almost done. A catalyst is a substance that's added to a reaction that increases the rate of reaction by decreasing the activation energy of the reaction. Alright, so write that down. Cool. Now I'll go and explain it. Think of it like a rock, all right? This is obviously an exothermic reaction, and this poor guy needs to push this rock up over the hill. You think he's going to do it? I don't think so. So what does a catalyst do? Well, he still has to have a hill in front of him, but the catalyst lowers the hill. It lowers the activation energy. This is your activation energy here. It's the amount of energy it takes to start the reaction. But if I take this and I make it much lower, I'll bet the guy could push the rock over that little hill, and then it's going to go all the way down here. Either way, you still get the same amount of energy coming out of this, whether you have a catalyst or you don't have a catalyst. This is no catalyst, and this has a catalyst. So this simply makes the reaction happen easier and faster. Okay, So we could draw it this way if we were looking at a chemical reaction where our activation energy is much higher if we do not have a catalyst. Our activation energy is lower if we have a catalyst. And in both cases, we end up down here. In both cases, we started here. So our delta H is going to be the same whether we have a catalyzed or an uncatalyzed reaction. Now, catalyzed reactions happen all the time around us. For example, you have a catalytic converter in your car, which 
converts carbon, di carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide by adding in, obviously, oxygen. You have enzymes in your digestive system that help you digest food. People who don't have these um, have problems digesting certain foods. Okay, So we do have enzymes in our system that help us catalyze reactions and make them happen easier. All right, folks, that's it. Sorry this was so long. Didn't have a choice on that one. Please do the worksheet. If you have questions, please see us in class. We'll be happy to help you. Take care. Bye-bye.